how those two things relate and how uh, who I am is affected by other people and they impinge on me and so on and so on, right? But mostly about the self, about one person at a time. Um, what's going to happen in the second half of the course is we're going to talk a lot more about how other people create the self or relate to it or something. So we'll get into things like social roles and how other people affect us and so on in some very, very general sorts of terms. Um, but what happens today is interesting because this, the, the topic of today's lecture um, and the follow-up reading that we'll do for next time uh, is this concept of bad faith from Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, and bad faith in this course kind of, um, it's kind of like a universal joint or something that connects the self with society. It's a psychological device, let's call it, that we use all the time, we, human beings, use all the time to integrate ourselves into relationships with other people, and especially with larger groups of people like organizations and so on. Right? And you'll see how that unfolds. Mainly what I'm going to do today is just talk briefly about what this concept refers to, what bad <coughs> faith is, first off. And then the whole rest of the lecture is just a whole slew of examples of all different kinds of bad faith. And along the way, I think you'll see, is there, yeah, you're, you're familiar with this idea? It's a good one. Huh? Yeah, it's, 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 they're getting excited already. <laughs> so um, just a whole slew of examples of bad faith and how it works, all right? All right. So to begin, uh, the term comes from Sartre's book, Being and Nothingness, which we've referred to before, L'Etre et le Néant. And it's in French, which is the way he originally wrote it, is mauvaise foi, which literally translates bad faith. Now, here's the trick. Some people translate it as self-deception. What we mean by bad faith is, what Sartre means by bad faith is the attempt to hide from one's responsibility as a free being in the world. So we've already talked in the course a lot about uh, Sartre has this notion that you're totally free, right? That you can just, in effect, do anything you want to. I mean, given the constraints of, okay, you know, I can't fly over the mountain or something, but basically I can choose at any moment to go in a new direction, do new things, interpret things differently, and so on. Okay, I've got this sort of total open-ended freedom. On the other hand, as we've also talked about, I exist physically. I'm a, I'm a thing, right? I'm a, this physical object. And there are things I can never do because of that. You know, I can never have a baby, for instance. It's just not in the cards, all right? And so Sartre realizes that people are both um, consists of a combination of kind of total freedom and what you might call total thingness. He calls this uh, the for itself and the in itself. It's coming from Hegel and its philosophy, and don't worry about it too much. Right? But we are both things, like physical objects in the world, and freedom, like the ability to do other stuff or go into the future in a new direction. And and what bad faith does is pretend to ourselves that we aren't that combination, okay? Because it's the combination of those two things that we could call responsibility, right? Or you remember judgment, our discussion last time about judgment, is that I can look at the world and make sense of it in various ways, right? So there's a connection between objects and things that are really out there and my own freedom to interpret them, right? Okay, this is all kind of background for the students. Right. So Sartre is going to say, gee, that means really we're this combination of freedom and constraint, if you want to call it that. We exist in the world, we can do things, 
and real stuff happens as a result. But that's a scary prospect because it means that I'm responsible for what I do. Responsible in the sense of both I can choose what to do, but also it matters. And there's no escaping the fact that it matters. In the example we've used all along, you can choose not to get up in the morning. You know, you'll stay in bed because the world is too spooky. But you're still staying in bed. And that has an effect on the world. Right? And Sartre says that leads, that as a minor example obviously, leads people to have all sorts of anxiety about who they are and what they're up to and they feel guilt about things and so on. Okay? Anxiety is this looming problem. Therefore, a lot of what we spend our time doing, especially in relating to other people, is pretending that we aren't responsible for what we do. All right? That's the key thing. And that's, like I say, this kind of linchpin or universal joint between the self and the society is the pretense, let's call it, that I'm not actually responsible for what I do. And bad faith is all about that idea and how we do that. Now, hint, if you want a little philosophical footnote, that's kind of a problem, okay? Pretending that you're not responsible is a, is a problem in the logical sense because it's a lie to yourself. Right? Self-deception is the way Walter Kaufman translates Mauvais foi. Walter Kaufman being a big famous philosopher of some years back who translated some of Sartre and was a big commentator on existentialism and so on. Okay? So he, trans he said bad faith should be called self-deception. Well, the problem, and this is just a, a sideline kind of footnote-y thing. Um, how do you lie to yourself? Because you know the truth, right? How is it possible? And we'll get into this as you see the examples. And yet, so logically, it's not possible. But phenomenologically, it happens all the time. <laughs> that is, if you look at your own experience, you can see you lie to yourself all the time <laughs> about things. And we'll see a bunch of examples. Okay? Let's turn the page. Oh, so I'll give you a, I'll start out with an example right here at the bottom. Um, so bad faith, you could think of as per, takes a lot of different forms, all right? One of them, though, is pretending that you are either nothing but a thing or nothing but freedom. Example. Let's just make up an example. One day, things are going badly, and I kill somebody. All right, so it's just an example. Right? So, I, I don't know. Some student asks the wrong question. <laughs> so, all right, so let's say I, I kill somebody. There are two possibilities. One is that I could say, well, I did, and people say, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And I could say, well, I could say, because I'm a murderer. Okay? I'm a murderer. That's why I kill people. It's in me. It's in, you know, it's deep embedded in my soul and it just every so often it comes out. <laughs> so you don't want to, don't take my intro class. Right? <laughs> okay, so maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just a murderer as, as, as like, you know, the lectern is a lectern. I exist as a murderer, again in Sartre's term, you know, the in itself. I'm a murderer in, in myself and it's, it's just intrinsic, it's just part of who I am. Right? But you see by claiming, well, why did I do it? I'm, because I'm a murderer. That's who I am. That kind of says I couldn't have been otherwise. Okay? It's an effort to dodge responsibility. The other possibility is I could say, one time. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, things got out of hand. I'll, get, <laughs> I'll grant you that. Normally, I would just have said, that's not a good question, <laughs> right? So, so there, I'm trying to say, no, no, no. I'm not what I actually did. I'm this other part of me that could have done otherwise, and usually does, other, uh, does otherwise, right? In other words, I'm hiding as a total, as my freedom. I'm trying to say, no, no, no. I'm not actually the thing 
that I did. I'm this other sense of possibilities. Look at all the good stuff I could do. All right? So that's a simple example. Let's, let's turn the page. So what I'm going to do now, and for the rest of the class, is give you a whole bunch of examples of this kind of thing in, a, in what I think of as different modes. All right? uh, I don't know. I just kind of made that up. <laughs> Four modes of bad faith. It's not Sartre's terminology. It's not an exhaustive list. It's really just a bunch of examples that I happen to classify in a couple of, you know, simple sort of ways. All right? So I would say, let's, let's talk about different modes of bad faith, different ways you can do this. All right, number one, starting with the easy ones. Number one is, is bad faith in the mode of temporality. In other words, playing with time and what counts, whether past or future or present, whatever counts. All right? So, uh, example number one. Bad faith in the mode of the past, let's call it. Well, you see this all the time. This is, uh, I went to a guy's house once, a few years back. I was, it was a wedding, and he was the brother of the bride, I guess it was, and she was older and stuff. Anyway, I went in their house, and, you know, we look around the guy's house, and we go in this room, and he's got this room. Now, this man's like 40 years old. Doctor. Did well, right? And he's got a room in his house that is completely devoted to his high school football career. Like trophies and pictures and newspaper articles. I mean, he was clearly a big star in high school football back when, right? But looking at this room, and then you start talking to him, and he got all excited, right? He's telling all these things. He's still kind of there, okay? It's a, not just a big deal in his life. It really is kind of who he is. Right? He kind of got stuck at this one period of time in his past, and that is he wants that to be definitive of his life in some ways. Right? Another variation of that is, is you do things wrong, and you know, like I, the murder thing or something. I say, hey, but look at look at my course evaluations. <laughs> they're, they're quite good. Right? <laughs> this this needs to count for something, right? Or or there are all these things I've done. Right? So you're feeling in a bad mood and you go back and you pull out your scrapbook, you know, and you're going through. You find some photo albums. See, I've got friends. I can s see, there they are, right there. You know, you're scrolling through Facebook. Academics are terrible, but it's bad at this sort of stuff. We have a thing um, uh, called the curriculum vitae. Are you familiar with this? It's, it's what you would call a resume. But your resume is supposed to be one pages, or one page or two page or something, the Career Center tells you. A CV is supposed to be long and filled with articles and books and prizes and, and talks given to everybody from the you know, American Philological Association down to the Rotary Club. You know, everything. And you, get, you talk to any professor and ask to see their CV. And it'll be on our website. You, know, you go and look, pop it open. Our, long lists of things, and there's no doubt about it. Curriculum vitae literally means course of life, course of your life. And there's this sense in which, you know, you've kind of added up all this stuff, and then every so often you look at it, you go, yeah, I mean, once a year, at least. I'm just telling you. Uh, when I have to do my annual report to the dean, you know, what you did this year, and you write up all, I did this, and I did this, and, you know, I had this workshop and I gave this talk and stuff. You pull out your CV to update it and then you, you find yourself starting to admire it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> I was big stuff in 1998. <laughs> right? and, and it's kind of comforting. I mean, there's no denying it, right? It's kind of comforting. So you see, well, you know, yeah, okay. Had a bad semester, but look at this. Right? You can kind of hold on to that. You can kind of hold on to that. Now, there are other variants. That's all positive stuff, but of course you can do the same thing in a negative direction. That is, you can, there are people who enjoy their failures. Who enjoy, for instance, being a loser. I don't mean they're like, yeah, this is great, but I mean they kind of dive into that and, you know, and wallow around them like I've screwed up everything. It's disastrous. I'm a total loser. I'm getting I haven't amounted to much. And you can kind of get caught up in that. And 
in the course of doing that, forget that, <laughs> tomorrow's another day. Right? Because it's kind of comfortable just knowing that you're just a loser. And you can't do anything about it. And again, one of my favorite examples of, on the, what some might see as the negative side is this thing about, like, I'm just shy. Why don't you go out and meet people? Oh, I'm shy. <laughs> well, how do we know that? Well, just look at my past. Look at my record. You know, there it is. It's all over the place. I never talked to anybody. <laughs> it's a fact, right? It's just, it's a given. That's who I am. Denying that part of who you are is also the possibility to do things differently. To stand up, you know, right now, walk over and say, hey, how are you doing? So you could do that. But again, there's, it's quite comforting and it absolves one of responsibility. If you can say, oh, I'm just shy, that's who I am. That's all there is to it. Okay, second possibility. Mode of the, of, uh, bad faith in the mode of the present, let's call it. Okay. By this, I'm just thinking um, about getting so focused in the present that you pretend like there's nothing else that matters. For instance, being so hyper busy on a day-to-day -day basis that you can't really think about the implications of what you're doing. Okay, I, I can't deal with that right now. I've, I've got to focus on this. You know, you, oh, gee, I wish I could, you know, sit down and think this one out. But no, no, no. We got to. You know, I'm caught up in the in the present, right? I'll cross that bridge when you come to it. Another, another version of this would be the person who, uh, you might say, hides in the present. I guess what I was thinking of with this is just, every so often I'll meet an adult, um, I think a particular person right now, actually, who, you know, in their 40s or so, you meet this guy, there's no, and, and watching him with children, it's clear, there's no indication this person was ever a child. <laughs> right? I mean, they have no connection with children. They, that's a different thing. Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I would never have done that. So, you know. I mean, it was, it's as if they've always been an adult. And that's what they're trying to project. Okay? Third possibility would be in the mode of the future, which is always talking about um, what I could do. Right? Or, no, 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 what I've done up to now doesn't matter. I have an example there. My, um, my dear departed mother used to say, and she did this for 30 years at least. Okay. My mom really liked chocolate. I mean, in a big way, like pounds of it in a whack and just sitting around the house. At any rate, well, this led to some... Uh, well, she gained weight. Okay, so, but anyway, she would say all the time. She would say, "Okay," she said, "I'm I've got to stop eating all this junk. I eat candy and chocolate. I'm starting my diet tomorrow, right?" And she was serious. She was serious. I mean, in 1970, she was dead serious about this. I'm tomorrow morning. I'm start. I'm throwing it all out. I'm starting. Okay, and she was serious, and she was still serious about it in 1980. 85, about 1990, my brothers and I actually gave her a plaque of famous things she said. We gave it to her for Christmas. And there were 10 of them. Things we learned from our mother is what we call them. But one of them was, I start my diet tomorrow. <laughs> right? At which point she kind of, you know, and then it got to be kind of a joke. But up until then, she was dead serious. Tomorrow morning, I'm Right? As if everything I've done up to now kind of doesn't matter. And it's a fresh day, and we're off to the future. Right? And things will, be, things will be great. Well, that can be, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you get up, you got to do something, right? But, but it can easily become a way of hiding from what you've actually done. Right? So confession, and a lot of serious religious thinkers have realized this one. They've written good stuff about it. What is confession? Confession can be a way of saying, okay, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm moving forward in the future. I'm going to do things different. Another possibility is confession is a way of detaching yourself from what you've actually done. It's a way of saying, I'm not that person. I'm a new person, see? And periodically you meet people who do this a lot, right? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I... I'm I didn't, oh, no, I was, that was terrible. 
And the more they can kind of berate themselves, the more they're saying, I'm not that bad person who did that. I'm this other person who now feels bad about it. All right? And they've detached themselves from their past. Which again, you know, you got to live, right? I'm not saying any of this is bad, morally speaking. I'm just saying this is kind of the way people work. All right? Let's go on. Okay. Second possibility. Bad faith in the mode of social roles. All right. So... Social roles, which we haven't really gotten into a lot so far in the course, but we will. I think you all know what I mean, though. Right? Like, like I, I pick up the role of professor. So when I came to Hamilton College, I knew there were things professors are supposed to do. And it's not just the job, like, okay, you got to teach a class. But you got to also have certain attitudes, ways of behaving. And back in the old days, one would smoke a pipe. <laughs> that was a big thing, you know, carry a little briefcase and smoke a pipe. And I met all these guys in grad school. Well, uh, Descartes has clearly exacerbated the, <laughs> the fundamental dualism of uh, you say in uh, angst. Puff, 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 right? And there was sort of a thing to being a professor where you have this whole pack of your behaviors and attitudes. You all understand that. Okay, so one can get into that and use it as a mode of bad faith. That is, I could be a professor in the sense of everything I do is sort of professorial. And I ex explain what I'm doing in those terms. And I excuse what I'm doing and say, well, I, that's just the way professors are supposed to be. Now, there are easy examples of this kind of thing all over the place. A friend of mine uh, from college, um, let's see. When we were in college, he was a, um, he majored in astrophysics, right? like big stuff. And he dreamt, dreamt of using supercomputers and doing things like that. And he said, well, what are you going to do, you know? We were just talking. Everybody's going to be a professor, all of my friends, and a lot of them. He said, well, I'm, he said, I'm probably going to go to work for the U.S. government and build atomic bombs. Oh, really? He says, yeah, well, that's what I study is hydrogen reactions, birth of stars, how stars are formed. Basically, the only real steady jobs in that line of work is building bombs for the U.S. government. <laughs> well, that's an interesting notion. You know, I hadn't considered that as a career option myself. But, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of big demand for sociologists in that kind of field. So, okay, that's fine. And sure enough, some years later, uh, that was what he was doing. And some years later, actually, I didn't see him for a while. I was in his wedding, and then I lost track of him. And like 15 years later, um, his name actually turned up in the news because <laughs> there was a little scandal kind of thing at Los Alamos. I don't know if any of the parents might remember this. Uh, at any rate, my friend at that point, turns out, was his official title was Associate... Okay, so he worked at Los Alamos National Labs and. New Mexico, and his, which is where the U.S. government tests atomic weapons, right? And hydrogen bombs and things. His official title was Associate Director for Thermonuclear Applications. <coughs> Thermonuclear Applications. Okay, let's like really, really big microwaves. Uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, there's a limited number of those out there, right? How many applications are there? Turns out he was the chief bomb maker for the United States of America. He really was. And uh, anyway, so, you know, talking with him about this, which I did a couple of times, you know, in the years since, because, you know, we'd been friends in college and stuff. Um, you know, you sort of gradually introduce the notion of, you ever worry about this kind of, you know, larger ethical. And his response was, you know, I'm a scientist, not a politician. That's, that's somebody else's job to figure out, you know, as the old Tom Lehrer song goes about um, Werner von Braun, who was a German guy who invented the 
rockets. And they said, once the rockets go up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, <laughs> <laughs> says Werner von Braun, right? Okay. Right? So there's a way of obviously kind of dodging ethical questions and things like that. When you get into your role, and that's sort of all you are. At any rate, okay, so that was too long on one example. But, um, <laughs> but there are a lot of other examples, and I kind of sketched out some of them there. Um, some of them can be quite useful. I mean, it's a good thing, for instance, when you uh, go to a gynecologist, you want that person to be nothing but a gynecologist. <laughs> Okay, not supposed to be a comedian, <laughs> not supposed to be like making chit chat, but okay, it's just it's a medical situation, and you want a single definition of the situation, and there's no fussing around with that, right? So it's a positive thing this can be this idea of people being <coughs> only the role that they're in. That's that's fine. Now the handout you got for next time, the Sartre reading, is. Um, on bad faith. It's this little sample out of being in nothingness. It's probably the most readable part of the whole book, too. It's an 800-page book or something, and this is the easiest part of it. Um, it actually includes a really famous example. Uh, one of the most... Okay. One of the most famous passages in 20th century philosophy and even literature. It's Sartre's description of the waiter in the cafe. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. It's quite a famous passage, and he just describes a waiter in a cafe bringing a tray of drinks to a table. And the point of that description is that the waiter, he says, we're, tr we're trying to figure out what this waiter is doing, you know, watching this, this guy, you know, really swooping through and dropping, putting the thing. And he says, what's the waiter trying to do? He said, the waiter is trying to be a waiter. That's all. Okay, nothing else. He's trying to be a waiter the way that a desk is a desk, where there's no ambiguity about it. There's no life outside of being a waiter. He's just completely waitering or waiterly or something like that. It's a beautiful description, you'll see. That's bad faith in the mold, in the mode of being in a role. Now, there are other variations that are kind of out of role, in role, people play with this difference all the time. But there are people, you know, there, you might meet somebody who uh, spends 40 years working a 9 to 5 or 6 to 6, I guess it is nowadays, but, you know, kind of job, working an office job. He says, oh, but really I'm an outdoorsman. What I love is hunting and fishing. That's who I really am. You say, wow, you get to get out every weekend? Well, no, it's been, you know, 7 or 8 years. I don't get a chance to do it very much, but that's who I really am. All right? So that person is, is, bad, is in bad faith in, in the form of saying, my role, my daily roles don't matter. That's not what's really going on in my life. There's this other thing that sort of exists out there somewhere. Right? Now, the very famous cases of this kind of thing are Adolf Eichmann, right? who was um, any familiar? Anybody? No? A few people, okay. Um, uh, World War II, uh, Nazis uh, running all of internal Europe, um, and they're shipping Jews off to extermination camps in Eastern Europe. Adolf Eichmann was the guy um, who was responsible for setting up train schedules, basically, for. Um, uh, exporting, you know, what's the word, uh, deporting Jews from all over Europe. Hungary and some Poland, not really Poland. Hungary and France and Denmark and wherever. Not Denmark, that didn't work out, but okay. He succeeded mightily in Hungary in particular. Anyway, he was in charge of organizing the deportation of Jews from Europe to Poland and Ukraine and so on, all right? To extermination camps. He knew completely what was going on. But, they caught him, you know, like 1961 or 60, I guess. Um, the Mossad, the Jewish, the Israeli secret service, secret police, whatever, not secret police. Okay. The Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, captured him in Argentina and smuggled him out of the country. Took him back to Israel for trial. And Eichmann, this is a very famous case. A lot of good stuff written about this, too. 
Eichmann's defense was, I was just doing my job. I didn't hate Jews. I didn't have anything against Jews. Some of my best friends were Jews. He went through all of this. Right? Very famous case because of it. And then there's this big debate emerging. Well, like, is that a legitimate argument? I mean, at a certain point, the guy really was involved in hideous stuff, right? He really was. And he was pretty high up in the whole operation. But he considered himself just the guy who set up train schedules. Okay? So he was saying, that's just my day job. Okay? After work, I love children. I play with dogs, you know. This kind of stuff, right? That's a classic case of really serious bad faith. Okay, let's go on. Third mode. Values. Now, this is harder to do. Okay, this is harder to do. What I mean by this is there's a kind of bad faith where you take the meaning of things as fixed. All right, so we've already talked in the class about how we, well, it's hard to say, how human beings give meaning to things in the world. But, but that's not quite right because like this lectern, I could say I'm the one who makes that a lectern by the way I use it. That's me giving it meaning. On the other hand, there's no doubt whoever created that had that, you know, they had that in mind. <laughs> right? Like the, the object already has in it some sort of meaning. At any rate, so um, bad faith in this form would be to take the meaning of things as just fixed, given, immutable, unchangeable, etc. So for instance, back when, when I pulled out the $20 bill out of my wallet, right? The, uh, the parents missed this one, I'm sorry. And I just tore it in two. There's this gasp from the... Right? Because at some level, people take that piece of paper quite seriously as a piece of money, okay? And like, you think that there's something intrinsic with that physical object that makes it valuable. And we kind of need to treat that as valuable, need to respect that, right? That is what Sartre would call the serious attitude, okay? Treating objects and situations as fixed, <laughs> immutable, given, serious, okay? Money is one example that I just like using. Uh, another would be to think that someone is an important person. I have to take that call. It's from the governor. You're choosing to take the call from the governor. It's the governor. <laughs> right? You don't understand? Right? And, and so treating that person as an item of sort of a fixed given value is, is reifying value and is, is saying that's a serious, that's the serious attitude. Grades would be another good example. Okay, most of you are here because in some ways you treat grades quite seriously, or at least have in the past. So a question is, are you still locked into that? You know, are you willing to just, you know, take a hike on a grade and say, ah, forget it, I don't care. <laughs> Maybe not. That's a tough habit to break. That's a tough habit to break. But where, where are grades? Right? Okay. So if on page 92 in this little book, which you did not read, but I'm going to read. I mean, you read the first part of the book, but not the second. Uh, this is Sartre. Uh, he's saying that the principal result of what he calls existential psychoanalysis, his way of straightening your head out, is to make us repudiate the spirit of seriousness. The spirit of seriousness, he says, has two characteristics. First, it considers values as transcendent givens independent of human subjectivity. Right? Now we talked about that when we discussed this book. Remember that? Okay. It treat number one, spirit of seriousness says values are out there, they exist, they're 
you know, they're in the cosmos and we have to honor them. And second, it transfers the quality of desirable from the ontological structure of things, by which in this case he means our relationship to them, to their simple material constitution. In other words, something is or is not desirable in itself. That's the spirit of seriousness. That's a beautiful person. Right? Yeah? Okay. That's a beautiful person, meaning we treat that person as beautiful, he would say is the real answer. Right? But to treat that, to treat beauty, for instance, as just a thing that inheres in a person, that's a mistake. That's a kind of bad faith. Right? It's giving up our own freedom to choose whether that person is going to be beautiful in our eyes or not. Okay? Um, that's just the way it is. That's the way we do things. Why do I act that way? I'm a Christian. That's the way I act. Right? My mom used to say, I would get into debates with my mother about all sorts of things. I'd say, I don't understand. Blah, blah, blah. Why do you think that? Well, yeah. Why do you think that? At the end, she'd just throw up her hands. She'd go, I can't help it. I'm just conservative. <laughs> she wasn't, actually. But, you know, she said, I'm just conservative. That's the way it is. Don't try to argue me out of it. Okay. Fine. That's bad faith. Right? That's saying, I can't decide what values I'm going to have or how I'm going to live or whatnot. Okay, the other possibility is not to be serious at all, but we'll call it the mode of the comic. You may know people who are always joking, and their jokes get a little, maybe, you know, a little edgy now and then, and they say something that's a little slightly offensive to you, and you go, uh, excuse me? And they go, hey, I was just joking. What's the matter? Can't, you know, come, lighten up. I'm like, okay, maybe. Right? And that they're never serious, right? You can never pin them down. I heard a speaker some years ago who was a postmodern critic. Any of you do this lit literature and you know postmodern? No? That's a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, part of this postmodernism thing is, is that they're always uh, commenting on your own comments and saying, well, here's my position. But of course, it could be this other thing. But of course, that could be this other thing. And we had this famous person come here some years ago, and I was involved with it. I remember sitting right here, and she was going on and on. People started asking questions, and every time you'd ask her a question and try to say, well, wait, but what you said was this, right? She goes, well, but of course, that can't be the full picture. And she was, you know, she would state a position, people would attack it, and then she'd kind of step over here. Say, well, see, of course that's wrong. We're like, well, shoot, you know. And there's a description in Sartre of such a person. He says, there are people who you go up and you're trying to confront them about something and you grab them by the lapels and you find yourself holding an empty coat. <laughs> right? They're always somewhere else. They're always somewhere else. They never really mean what they say. Right? I mean, they sound like they do and you think it's real, but then when you try to nail them down, they slip away. Okay, that's bad faith in the mode of, we might call it, the comic. The person who never wants, constantly ironic. People, I don't know, Stephen Colbert, where is he? You know, I, I'm just, I just pull that out of the air. I don't, is that really him, or is he somebody else? Okay. All right. Um, let's see, where are we here? Oh, yeah, okay. So, in general, then, In general, then. See, this is a short one today. What we got, I don't know, let's drop back and see if we can make sense of this, kind of theoretical sense of this. All right. There's no question about it. Sartre has, um, he's a Cartesian. That is, he sees the world as consisting of two different kinds of things. The one thing being the mind or freedom or what does he call it, the race, um, what's it called? There's race extensa and there's um, race cogitans. Right, so the mind, which is totally free, can go in any direction it wants, you can think of anything you want, like, you want to or like. Right? And the other is we exist as physical substance. All right? 
And the problem for Sartre, of course, this is jumping ahead a little bit in court, is how do you bring those things together? Okay, how do you reconcile, you might say, mind and body? That would be one example of that. Once you've separated them, it's pretty darn hard to get them back together again. You know, like we said last time, I said, okay, I'm thinking to myself, lift the right arm. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know, I can just think it, and it happens. <laughs> How'd that work? <laughs> you know, and then if you if you just go all neurosciencey, and you can say, well, there's a chemical that's excreted, and so, okay, fine. But if it's just a chemical excretion, what's this mind business going on? And where exactly is that? All right. So Sartre starts out with this mind-body separation right from the get-go. Okay? And that turns out to probably be a weakness in his philosophy. Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger, all these people say he's, he just got off on the wrong foot to begin with. But this is where, you know, what we're opening with. And don't worry, we'll pull it together in a couple of weeks. All right. So Sartre is a Cartesian, he's got this split thing going. But given that, he's hit, he's hit on this really revealing sort of idea. And he's done it through phenomenology, that is through examining immediate lived experience. And he says, and in looking at immediate lived experience, he realizes all the time, like in all these examples, we are lying to ourselves about what we are. We're pretending to be something that we know we are not. All right? Now again, logically, that's a real serious problem. <laughs> Because how can you lie to yourself? How can you actually convince yourself that you're nothing but your job when you know that's not true? And yet, phenomenologically, that is, if you look at our own experience, we do it all the time. It really seems to be a real thing. Okay? All right. Um, so... Let's see. Maybe the answer is, Sartre has this line, uh, it's up there, right. okay. which is, he says, look, the reality is, I am not what I am, and I am, and I am what I am not. He loves this kind of business, and these little paradoxes, like, oh, that sounds clever. Okay, I am not what I am. Okay, so I'm a teacher, right? Pretty Pretty clearly, it's 31 years of it. Okay, I'm a teacher, but it would be dishonest for me to tell you I am a teacher, and that's it. Okay, because the truth is, oh, there's more to it than this actually. Um, I am. It's not only that I am not just a teacher. It's that I'm a teacher in the form of, or in the style of being one, somebody who didn't have to be, All right? In other words, I'm a teacher in the way that only a human being can be a teacher. That is, I'm a lot of other things as well, and I never had to be a teacher. It wasn't intrinsic. I have to choose to do it every day. You see? Once the lectern exists, it can't be anything but a lectern. But a human being doesn't even have that option. I can never be a teacher the way the lectern is a lectern, which is in itself. Right? I can only be a teacher in the form of somebody who every minute has to keep choosing to do it instead of walking out of the room. Right? And bad faith is about forgetting that or cutting ourselves off from that reality. Okay, so I am not what I am and I am what I am not. In other words, an important part of who I am is the fact that I'm not just a teacher. Okay. In bad faith, it's, it's denying one side or the other of that. All right. Final little thought. Um, the metastable thing I'm going to come back to next time. We'll talk about that later. But it's basically metastable refers to the idea that in bad faith, the bad faith is metastable, meaning it keeps failing. It keeps failing. The more you try to pretend to yourself 
that you're one of these things or the other thing being the wrong word, sorry. One of these sides or the other. The more you try to pretend that you're only one, the more you keep reminding yourself that you're also the other. <laughs> Which is why it's impossible for Sartre to be sincere. And he'll talk about that. You can't be sincere. Right? The way a lecture is a lecture. In other words, just as you're trying to really tell people the honest truth, you're looking at yourself doing it. <laughs> Which is to say you're slipping out over here. Right? So bad faith is metastable, is the word he'll use. Alright. Um, something's doing. What's my last little point here? Oh, well, yeah, basically the whole point of bad faith is to escape the anxiety of being a free person who's in the world at the same time, right? Being in the world and all that. We're stuck in the world. Everything you do actually has impact or not. You're building a record, all of that. Bad faith is just an effort to escape that. Okay? So, that's it for the day. Um, read the article for next time, and um, hope you all have a nice time this weekend. This is fun. Thanks. Thanks very much.